Hey, everybody. I am so excited because we're about to go where we have not gone before. Okay, yeah, you get the Star Trek reference because we got George Takei, Sulu, joining the podcast. Yes, I'm so excited to have Mr. Takei on board. He is a social justice activist, a social media superstar, Grammy-nominated recording artist, New York Times bestselling author, and a pioneering actor. A lot of people don't realize this brother's been doing this for 60 years um, in, in uh, both TV and films. Um, but he stepped away from all of that uh, to tell his very personal journey, a story about growing up in a U.S. internment camp during World War II, at the end of World War II, um, along with 120,000 other Japanese Americans. The book is They Call Us Enemy, the author is none other than George Takei, and we're about to get into it on the Michael Steele podcast. George Takei, I tell you, dude, I am so excited to have you join the podcast to be a part of this conversation. Um, I, you know, I, I just spent, I spent my life, uh, you spent so much time in my living room and, and in my office, uh, here at my desk, watching, watching you do your work, um, not just in, in, on the small screen and the big screen, but out in the community as well, you've become, uh, a genuinely effective advocate, uh, on behalf of, uh, groups individuals, uh, communities that are often um, uh, underrepresented in the conversation, shall we say. Uh, and you have done such a masterful work. And I want to get into um, specifically uh, the work that was born out of your, your new effort. Uh, they called us, uh, I don't know if I want to get it right. They, I want to get That's it right. That's correct. They That's called it. us enemy. They called us enemy. Me, That's the correct. They called us enemy. on this end as well. I am so excited to be talking with uh, one of my, my my icons on MSNBC. <laughs> the wisdom that you send out over the uh, airwaves. Well, I appreciate it, sir. So, what what did you what inspired you? Because this this is a this is a very different approach to a very gnarly conversation about the uh, you know, placing uh, Japanese Americans in concentration camps um, uh, during World War uh, II. You you took a graphic novelist approach, which I found actually not just effective but an important way to tell that story. Talk about your thinking there and, and what, what it was you were trying to do in, in sort of bringing the story of this little boy in these concentration camps um, to life through uh, the eyes you now have. Well, uh, when I was a teenager, I loved comic books like all teenagers. And I initially wrote uh, about my childhood incarceration uh, at, in my autobiography, which was published in 1994. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, it, uh, that story is still not generally known, at least uh, uh, when uh, I was thinking of writing another book. Right. And, and uh, I went into great detail in my autobiography. It was published in 94. And I said to myself, I want to get the story to be a part of American history. We need the next generation to know about this uh, chapter of American history. And uh, remembering my childhood infatuation with uh, comic books, I thought graphic memoir, that's the way to tell the story, right. to reach the next generation. And it turned out that that was a good uh, strategic move because uh, it became a bestseller. So now I'm working on another version of that same story. Mm -hmm. I'm writing a children's picture book. Oh. Where I'll cover two generations, daddy or mommy, reading the story to little Johnny and little Janie. Mm -hmm. So they're share uh, so I'm writing it uh, with the uh, 
uh, much simpler language. Uh, words like uh, uh, swear allegiance or forswear allegiance. Right. I had to revise and say, uh, love America and for for swear uh, allegiance to the emperor uh stop loving someone mm -hmm. but how do you stop loving someone who you didn't love in the first first place, place yeah so that's my current challenge to put into simple children's words uh those uh, ideas that uh, we discussed as a graphic memoir which was targeting more or less the uh teens and right. early 20s. You, that you, was it, a strategy. It's, it's fascinating the way you do it because what I love about this approach, and it's actually an approach I've taken in my public work when I was Lieutenant Governor, and I'm dealing with sort of the, the difficult issues on education and um, what goes on in and outside of a family. So you, you can get the kind of resources a family may need directly to them. One approach that I took, which I really appreciate about this book is you do it, I did it then and you do it now through the eyes of the children. So this is not the perspective of an adult sort of telling the story, but it is the narrative as seen by a child, as experienced by a child. And even in the, in, as you're describing the, the next effort, you still have that element of yeah, mommy and daddy may be reading the story to the child, but you're, you're still going to bring in that element of the child's experience mm -hmm. of what it is they're being told. Or in the case of, of this effort, um, what they see and what they experience. How, how, did, how did that make you feel writing that? I mean, because that's, that's a very unique perspective. Well, I was... Uh five years old. I just turned five years old uh, when the soldiers came uh, three weeks after my fifth birthday. Mm -hmm. And that morning is one that will remain in my memory. It's just burned into it. My uh, father got, I, I was sharing a bedroom with my brother, uh, Henry, mm -hmm. a year younger. And my father came into our bedroom and dressed us hurriedly and said, uh, we're going to be moving and daddy's got to help my, uh, mama with uh, the pack, packing. So you boys go to the living room and uh, and stay there. And so we did as, as we were told and right. not, had, not having anything to do, we were standing by, uh, by the front window, just gazing out at the neighborhood. And suddenly we saw two soldiers marching up our driveway, carrying rifles, with shiny bayonets on them. That was a shocking thing. They stomped up the front porch and with their fists began banging on the door. I remember how scary that was. Mm -hmm. And my father came rushing out of the bedroom and answered the door. And literally at gunpoint, we were ordered out of our home. I, I was absolutely terrified, as was my brother. And my, my father took charge. He was uh, cool and calm. He uh, gave both of us a small packages to carry. And he hefted two heavy suitcases. And we followed him out onto the driveway and stood there waiting for our mother to, be, uh, to come out. Right. And she took a, a, a bit of time. We had a baby sister, not a year old yet. And... When she finally came out, she had our baby sister in one arm and a huge duffel bag in the other, and tears were flowing down her cheeks. It was a day, a morning I will never forget. We were piled onto uh, trucks with other Japanese American families uh, that had been uh, gathered mm -hmm. uh, together with their luggage, and we were driven downtown to Little Tokyo to the Buddhist temple where there were other families uh, all assembled and there was a row of uh, buses there and we were all loaded onto those buses with our luggage and taken out to the Santa Anita racetrack, unloaded and herded over to the stable area. And each family was assigned a horse stable, mm. a horse stall mm. to sleep in. I can't imagine now today 
how degraded and humiliated my parents must have felt. But to five-year-old me and my brother four years old, we get to sleep with the horses. Right, right, so right. Two different perspectives on yeah. the same event. Yeah, it, it just, and as you're describing that, being placed in a horse stall, I'm thinking back to the previous administration putting kids in cages. Exactly. And the story that says about our government then as a young five-year-old George TK and what it says about our government now. Um, Very much related. That's still, that's still an approach they can take to dealing with, with human beings. When you- well, the, the, uh, At the border, we, uh, we always said uh, in the horse stalls, we had our parents with us. That was so important to us. An important piece, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But at our Southern borders, the children are torn away from their mothers. Yeah. I mean, the, their, their stability, their, their source of security is taken from them and put in cages. So it's much worse now than it was for us. I mean, uh, yeah, all things being relevant, right? Degrees, but, uh, <laughs> our parents were always with us. And that was the important thing. With, and with that's an important, because uh, I can imagine it's a very different story for young George if when you walk down that sidewalk to the, to the awaiting uh, vehicles, your mom and dad went into one vehicle and you went into another. Um, oh my lord! That's that occurred a to us. Very different story. With, with that, and given your experience um, as a child, as as a child in a Japanese internment camp, um, not a Japanese th- internment camp. Though those were run by the government of Japan. Japan, jo- I Japan. always correct. Correct. That. That's we're correct. Americans uh, uh, ordered out by the U.S. military. That's correct. And taken to American barbed wire concentration camps. That I, I, I always tell the uh, press. It's Japanese Americans. Right. Japanese internment camps were run by Japan. We were not in camps run by Japan. That that's exactly and I stand corrected and I misspoke on that. You're absolutely right about that. And and I apologize for getting that uh wrong. The 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 point is when for you as a young child being placed in this in this type of an internment camp, um, what did that teach you about this concept of democracy? In this in this great land, um, as a young child, and 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 what did that say to you about being an American? Then, because I want to relate it to to later on in your life, when you are a young man starting out in Hollywood, and this opportunity to be on what will become an iconic program later on. Th- there's a long march indeed for that. But it starts there in the internment camp. And it really, in some cases, George, would negatively shape your view of this country. What was that, what was that process like for you as a young child from that moment growing up into adulthood? The vital factor in my life was my father. Mm. At that time, I, I wouldn't have understood democracy. My father, who was an immigrant, He was brought from Japan as a boy to San Francisco by my immigrant grandfather. So uh, although he was born there, he was reared, educated, and went to uh, college in San Francisco. Uh, He spoke Japanese and English fluently. And he loved America and our democracy. And so the word democracy was introduced to me in stages after mm-hmm. we were released. And I, when I, it was when I entered my early teens, I had many, many long discussions after dinner with my father. And my father was an unusual man. So many Japanese American parents of my parents' generation never talked about it with their children. Mm. Many Japanese really? Americans, younger, uh, know that their parents were in camp, but that's all they know. When we did the musical Allegiance, which we developed on the internment of Japanese Americans on Broadway, mm-hmm. 
younger Japanese Americans. And from my vantage point, if you're 60, they're younger than me. <laughs> and they, I consider them young Japanese Americans. Right. They would come backstage to tell me how moved they were, uh, were and how deeply uh, uh, impressed they were by the show. Uh, and so, and, and they would tell, tell me that their parents or their grandparents were in camp. That's the term that we use in camp in the Japanese American community community. And so I'd say to them, Oh, uh, your parents or your grandparents were in camp, which camp were they in? Their face is a blank, right? Right? Because their parents didn't talk about it. Was that just because to, of shame? Or was that just because that was a chapter in their lives? that their parents had just said, you know, we won't deal, we just won't deal with that. Uh, it's both pain and shame, ah, Okay. but the shame was uh, uh, misplaced. The shame was the government's mm -hmm. and yet the victims take on that shame and they remember the pain that uh, goes with it. And so they didn't want to inflict that on their children. So they didn't talk about it at all. So they grew up knowing uh, my parents or, or, or their parents or their grandparents were in camp. Right. That's all they know. I, even if I, I try, when I tried to help them out by saying, was it in Wyoming? Was it in Arkansas? Was it in Idaho? Right, right. They, they, they know nothing about it. And so I felt a, 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 an even more intensified mission to inform and educate other Japanese Americans about their own family histories. So I have a double mission to remind America of how fragile our democracy is and to let Japanese Americans who grew up knowing their parents or grandparents were in camp, but not any understanding of what that right, was all about. Right. I have a double mission. Uh, and my father taught me about the importance of citizen participation in government. And uh, he urged his children, uh, my brother and my sister, uh, about participating in student government. Hmm. Uh, we, we have to be... He said the uh, ideals of, of uh, American democracy are, the words are shining words, but right. they're just words. Pe the people have the responsibility to make it have meaning. And so we have to be actively involved in the community, in uh, in, in school, and I, I ran for student body president in middle school, and, there you and go. I won. There you go, little politician. <laughs> <laughs> from way back. <laughs> from, Mr. From the president. Time I was an early teen, yeah, I was uh, <laughs> campaigning. <laughs> and my father had uh, a, a gross, grocery store at that time. He tried ma many things after uh, incarceration. And uh, uh, through uh, through my father, he was able to get hard candy <laughs> for wholesale, and so I had my pocket filled with hard candy. And when I went around uh, 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 the uh, school uh, uh, corridors, I'd shake hands <laughs> and I'd leave a little something sweet. <laughs> oh, look at you! <laughs> Oh, uh, and, and people in talking school. about money and politics now, baby, it's all candy. It's all candy. <laughs> Some sweetness, and that's what I was going to bring to them. And that was a sample of what I was going to give them. <laughs> in high school, I was a senior board president. And the first campaign that my father took me to was the Adlai Stevenson for President campaign. Wow. Headquarters. Yeah. And having a campaign for myself in junior high school, I, I saw what was happening on that grand scale. Yeah. Uh, 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 hundreds of people there, uh, all volunteers uh, 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 line, uh, sit, sitting at a long table, stuffing envelopes, and, uh, and the next person would uh, 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 swipe it over a wet uh, sponge and seal them and so forth. It was fascinating and it was fun right. and it was exciting and inspiring. Uh, Eugene McCarthy, Senator McCarthy mm -hmm. uh, would come in. I met Eleanor Roosevelt 
really? uh, for the first time in person. But an interesting thing on that day, my father suddenly, suddenly felt unwell and uh, he had to go home. And at that time, I, th I thought, oh, daddy uh, couldn't stay. He missed out on meeting Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. But later on, mm -hmm. I understood why. He knew she was a good woman, yeah. but it was still his wife. Yeah. The man yeah. who sent us into imprisonment. Yeah. Still very now, personal and raw in many respects for him. It was indeed. So, but it was my father who uh, guided us into participation and understanding of American democracy. And I became active in many, many campaigns for U.S. Senator for uh, uh, George Brown, mm -hmm. Congressman George Brown for uh, uh, U.S. Senate. Senate he yeah. Never, he didn't win. Uh, Jerry Waldy for governor of California. He didn't win. <laughs> but then I joined uh, Tom Bradley, uh -huh, an yeah. American uh, city councilman yeah. and former policeman for uh, mayor of Los mayor. Angeles. Yeah. He lost the first time, but I got to know him well and became uh, active in uh, supporting all his activities. And so when he ran a second time, he asked me to be the chair of his Asian American committee. Right. And I was, I was a, a, a young <laughs> person. He, he asked me, and I was more than happy to do that. And he won. Yeah. And when he won, he appointed me to the uh, board of the uh, Southern California Rapid Transit District with the uh, mandate to get started on building the first heavy rail subway system in Los Angeles. Because oh. he said, the downtown is going to be the unquestionable center of Los Angeles. You know, our reputation was that we're spread It's so spread out, yeah. He said, this is going to be essential for downtown to be a, a, a vibrant, functional downtown. And so we got the half cent sales tax passed for our match. And we went to Washington and lobbied for uh, 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 the uh, federal match, right. uh, went to Sacramento. So, you know, I was, I, Tom Bradley was the one who uh, involved me in all this uh, uh, actual. Uh, Got you up close and personal with it. Yeah, no, but it, it's fascinating because it, you know, from the, from the story of your, you know, kitchen table conversations with dad about democracy, despite the, the personal family history um, and the tragedy around internment, um, that love of country and that sense of America's promise is still eminent and, and so important to the, to the extent that you found ways to utilize it, usually utilize that in grade school politics uh, <laughs> and, and, and getting involved publicly. So I, I, I guess in one sense, I, I could say, or you could confirm that your, your faith in this democratic system, uh, while at times challenged, remains strong. And, and, and is that, can you say that in the face of January 6th from your perspective? Because I think you would bring a unique appreciation of exactly what January 6th says uh, and what it means um, if we don't American, pay attention. Throughout American history, we have been challenged. Our democracy has been challenged. And as a child, I really felt, I mean, I didn't understand it, but I, the scary uh, barbed wire fence and the uh, sentry towers with the machine guns pointed at us, some of the riots that we had in camp, and uh, some uh, at night, some, some of the, tr quote, troublemakers, people that were angry, uh, would, uh, be, their units would be raided and dra uh, uh, dragged out, mm -hmm. and their wives or uh, sisters or... Uh, uh, mo mothers would be uh, screaming and shouting, you know. So I have these very real memories from of incarceration and the horror of it. And uh, uh, I remember one uh, 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 assembly that uh, I went to with my father, which turned into a uh, riot, and my father taking me by my hand and running like bats out of hell back to our uh, barrack. Right. So I, I've seen the horrors of it. And January 6th 
was something like that in a different shape and form. Right. Our democracy is always challenged. Uh, in the 60s, uh, when uh, uh, we were doing Star Trek, and, and the uh, utopian idealism of, uh, of uh, Gene Roddenberry yeah. uh, depicted was a result of the turmoil of the 60s, the civil rights movement going on, mm -hmm. the uh, Vietnam War tearing this country. I mean, the war was way out over there in Southeast Asia, but America was being torn apart by those who fiercely supported the war and those who were campaigning hard for peace. And I was, by that time I was an actor, so I had joined the uh, Hollywood group called EIPJ, right. Entertainment Industry for Peace and Justice. And I became great friends with uh, uh, Jane Fonda and uh, Donald Sutherland. As a matter of fact, Jane helped fund one of the uh, rallies that we had in the Asian American community. Mm. She was a very generous and fully committed person. And I, I still bridle at people who uh, see her as uh, a, a mindless radical. She was really a passionate. No, if you, if you study her history, you know that she, she was not mindless about anything that she did, particularly Absolutely. when it came to her, her civic responsibility. So she took it very seriously. And it's fascinating to hear that connection um, with the two of you, um, particularly given, given your own personal journey, to have that sort of reinforcement from a broader community, a white community, um, you know, as an Asian American, uh, really, and again, as you said, Gene Roddenberry kind of put his finger on this sort of utopian ideal um, that is evinced in our founding documents. Uh, you know, um, precisely, and 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 uh, to sort of live that out on the screen in Star Trek, as well as in reality, through the work you were doing um, in Hollywood, uh, it kind of brings me to the point of your TED talk, where you talk about you know why I love the country that once betrayed me, um, and and that that narrative of love, that narrative of the ideal still matters. It still has value. And despite the difficulties, you can't give up because the love is the thing, the love of country, the love of family, uh, the love of community are the things and that the hold love us together. of the ideals of this country, democracy. Exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, my father, when I was a teenager, neat teenager, explained to me, in our case, there were no charges. Uh, when you're arrested in our democracy, we have what's called uh, uh, due process. When you're arrested, you have to have the right to know why you're arrested. And then you have the right to challenge it right. in the court of law, where they have to back up their charge with evidence. And then if you indeed uh, are guilty, then you pay the price. Or then there's a punishment. In our case, there was no charge, no trial, just punishment simply right. because we look like this that's right our race and that's the original sin of this country we know about 1619 right i mean what for us our incarceration was four years for african americans as you well know <laughs> four it's, it's a work in progress <laughs> it's still going it's on still going on still going on i mean was, black lives was... matter it mattered in 1619 too right and and asian lives mattered then and uh, it, it still hasn't been resolved asian uh there uh, asians are no it right hasn't now because of uh that guy yeah uh, that 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 so-called president uh constantly saying uh, china virus and uh, wuhan virus yeah. uh, kung flu uh th that's the responsibility that he had that he failed utterly he betrayed the ideals of democracy and he fomented uh, uh, uh stupidity and and uh, wild uh, uh, behavior and that's what uh, uh, January 6th was too. So, you know, that's one part of American history that we must overcome by having the majority who are responsible citizens uh, respond to it. And the, the uh, uh, Congressional Commission right now is uh, uh, doing that process. And that's what, in our case, uh, 
from the Japanese American community, a movement began to get redress for that unjust in imprisonment and the government taking everything that we had. Uh, they froze our bank account. I mean, yeah. that's really putting you in a straitjacket. Oh, yeah. Uh, my father's business was destroyed. Our home was taken because uh, mortgage payments couldn't be made. And so we know that this, ha uh, because the people are, are fallible people, democracy has its fallibility. And we, we have the job of making sure that our I ideals are supported by people who understand what it, what it means. And so every generation has to come up with it. What happened to Japanese Americans in the 40s is happening again on the southern borders mm -hmm. or on our streets where people are spat at and yelled at and assaulted. That happened to us in the 40s too. The, the, uh, the words uh, were uh, different words, Jap or, right. or a spy right. or uh, saboteur, you know, but uh, it's the same uh, because our, I call teachers the pillars of democracy. Education is so important and we don't have that opportunity now. The uh, radical people are now assaulting education. Well, and critical race theory, exactly. Exactly. They, They're you, not teaching that. You, you can't. You can't get, tell your passionate. story and my story because some white folks may be traumatized by it. <laughs> like, they the? mustn't be made to feel guilty. No. But, you know, we have a history of guilt. I mean, oh, when uh, we, the Japanese American community, uh, started a movement for an apology and redress. Uh, the, the the resistance was very strong but the the amazing thing about, about american democracy we had in congress japanese americans and in the senate two japanese americans in uh, from hawaii senator yeah. danny Inoue. danny Inoue, loose, uh huh loose um, uh whose arm was injured during the war yeah left it in italy Yep. And uh, Senator Spark Matsunaga, who was also a veteran of the 442nd, two Japanese Americans in the Senate, and we had uh, one, two, three, four uh, congressmen. Mm -hmm. And that made the difference, too, because they were now part of that legislative body. And they, uh, Senator Inouye uh, suggested that uh, uh, Congress form a commission. And so in 19... 80, they formed the commission to gather information on the internment as if the government didn't have information. They had all the information right, they, right. Uh, covered. And so they held hearings, and I testified at that hearing as a, uh, uh, as a person who was a child at that time, but how it affected my development as mm -hmm. an American and as a, a person who believes in democracy. And that I said to the commissioners, we all, you commissioners and the elected officials have the responsibility to make our ideals really true, to be vibrantly alive because fallible human beings have mm. been messing it up throughout yeah. history. Yeah. And so now, you know, with the redress movement uh, for African-Americans, Japanese Americans strongly support that. Uh, we, we've been talking about that in, in the Japanese American Citizens League, mm -hmm. uh, our civil rights organization, somewhat comparable to uh, the NAACP, is strongly in support of redress for uh, African Americans. Yeah, How you've been, to structure I, it is a big, big challenge. You've been you've been part of uh, one of the leading voices, as a matter of fact, um, on HR forty. Um, uh, which is the reparations uh, right. legislation, uh, again, <clears throat> making that case um, to begin the process of the government redressing uh, these issues. Uh, how, how do you see those, those storylines playing out in this environment? We're, you know, George, right now, we can't even get members of our United States Senate to agree that voting rights in this country matter. <laughs> so black folks sitting there waiting for reparations be like okay <laughs> don't <laughs> well you'll get back to us right <laughs> uh, it's almost ludicrous but you know 
it is so deadly serious. And so that's why I say, you know, our, throughout history, the same th thing that happened to Japanese Americans in the 40s it, in different form has been happening uh, in, uh, throughout our history. Yeah. Because we have shining noble ideals, but it's so dependent on fallible human beings. And we've got to get them educated and make them aware that our democracy is very fragile and it requires people who understand democracy to be actively engaged in it. And the trouble is these people who call themselves patriots and ass assault uh, uh, the uh, capital are the polar opposite of, Absolutely. of patriots. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I got one last question for you before I let you get out of here. This is, I got to be the Star Trek fan, dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I got to go. I grew up um, in front of my television in, in our household. Um, Star Trek is a big deal. And um, good, good. And, and, you know, whenever I'm asked, you know, uh, Captain Picard or Captain Kirk, I'm like, oh, hell yes, Captain Kirk. What are you talking about? <laughs> Absolutely. But the, the, the one thing I want to say, um, because it is, it's, it's interesting how stories evolve and then backstories you kind of fill in. Your character was one I always thought was cool uh, for a whole lot of reading, uh, reasons. But what I appreciated in, in sort of the, the updating of the Star Trek story <laughs> was the idea that they would show that that side, that human side of of the character, if you will, in in this, in, in these times, and 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 see that tie in to some of your work in the in real life uh, with the LGBTQ community, and and some of the uh, again um, the idealism of of Gene Roddenberry sort of coming through in that respect. How do you see the presentation today? of science fiction uh, as a leading indicator of, of possibly of where we can go as, as a people, um, not just here in this country, but globally, because Star Trek has that kind of impact, obviously. And you, certain, you played, played a role in that. In, in the 60s, Star Trek played a very strong leading role, as you well recognize. Mm -hmm. And science fiction is, uh, the freedom of the imagination. And yes, there is the freedom that to go dark as uh, in human uh, yes, uh, society. Yes, as sometimes we do, right? Yes, <laughs> but it's also the freedom to really shine. And science fiction, I think, is um, one of the, the ro roads to education, educating uh, us on what might be and what, uh, and to... Uh, illustrate how much we've advanced. Like here I am talking to you uh, in my uh, study here. Right. And you're in Washington, D.C. Right. Or in Maryland. Maryland, yeah. And and uh, in color, uh, immediate. <laughs> when we came out of camp uh, back in 1940, uh, actually we, we came out in 1946. Mm -hmm. We were one of the last to be released. Wow. Uh, and uh, my father took us to uh, uh, a movie, a color movie, Technicolor, where it was green was so lush green. And he took us to see uh, Ro uh, The Adventures of Robin Hood. Right. And Sherwood Forest in all its verdant glory and those crimson capes, velvet yep. capes, you know. And uh, uh, Robin Hood stealing from the rich people and giving it to the poor. I mean, that was a stirring thing. <laughs> and that, uh, so uh, in one of the, our episodes, the writers came up with the idea, uh, the uh, virus, we were talking about viruses back then. Yeah, exactly. That invade the, our bodies through uh, our, the palm of our hand, the mm -hmm. sweat, and it affects our sense of inhibition or propriety. And uh, when it affected me, I, uh, the writers had me brandishing a samurai sword. I said to him, well, I'm Japanese American. And so that's ethnically uh, consistent. Right. 
But when I was a kid, I didn't go around playing uh, a samurai in my backyard. I, I said, uh, Sulu is a 23rd century guy, and his sense of his heritage would be much wider than narrowly ethnic. And I said, when I was a kid, I played um, Robin Hood in my backyard. My backyard was Sherwood Forest. <sighs> and uh, Martha Gonzalez was my uh, Maid Marian. Right. <laughs> And that skinny, tall, blonde guy was my Friar Tuck. <laughs> because it was my backyard. It was your backyard. Made, <laughs> she made the, sewed the costumes. Right, right. You <laughs> so, cast it the way you wanted to cast exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> and so I said, why not put a fencing foil in his hand rather than a samurai sword? Really make it a science fiction thing, you know. Right. And he said, that's a great idea. <laughs> and that turned out to be my favorite episode. Wow. And I take my shirt off, all sweaty. And, and I remember that. Yes. Working out. Yeah, it's and, a young fit Sulu. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. George Takei, I, I, this has been such an enlightening and enjoyable conversation. Uh, with you, um, it just it, lucky it, me to be talking about all the things I love talking about with you, no, dude. I'm just a brother in the neighborhood, right? Just, yes, you I'm, are. I'm, I'm just a player in your backyard. <laughs> just cast me as you, as you see me. I will cast you as a sheriff of a of a of Nottingham. <laughs> that works out of character. Me. That works for me. You I would make it. a great villain. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Look, I, I play I played the the devil uh, in uh, Damn Yankee. So I, oh, you did. I, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can I can I can uh, wear me goatee when I need to, right? But it well, is. It, but you're gonna have to act because you're so good natured and <laughs> such a charming guy. It's gonna challenge your acting talent. <laughs> well, I will I will certainly play this part of our conversation for my wife and my kids. So <laughs> and so they know exactly that that is true. But I appreciate you, brother. I really do. Uh, I appreciate the work you're doing out there. God bless you. Uh, and thanks for joining the, co the podcast, my friend. Live long and prosper. I like that. I like, see, I could, I could try that, but the fingers just, I can get it. Okay. There we go. <laughs> there you are. Let me, to make you feel much better. The high priestess of the Vulcans, this is a Vulcan greeting. Right. Uh, was played by Dame Judith Anderson. Dame, that's right. Yes. A, a, a luminary of uh, a legitimate theater. She w was in, in her uh, Vulcan getup. I sure remember that. Yeah. When we got to shooting that scene, she could not do this. The high priestess could not <laughs> greet people with the Vulcan greeting. And so how what they did was they put uh, masking tape between her fingers. <laughs> and for her close up, she held her uh, fingers in place. Um, right, right, range. right. And right. on cue, she let go and brought it up like that. I love it. <laughs> It's, it's always the little secrets. So that's always the little secrets. That is no, so cool to know. It's no longer a secret. You can broadcast it to <laughs> the whole MSNBC audience. <laughs> well, I Dame Judith Anderson was a fake Vulcan. <laughs> <laughs> you got any more goodies for me? <laughs> oh, I have a bag full of them. <laughs> oh, I bet you do. Look, I didn't. I wouldn't even get into the whole conversations about Kirk and uh, Leonard <laughs> Nimoy. We just leave all. All that for another time and that then we have a little that's we'll a have promise a, have a few drinks on that one. <laughs> oh, good yes i'll <laughs> certainly join you on that invitation george decay i appreciate the social justice activist social media superstar grammy nominated recording artist new york times best-selling author and pioneer in both uh stage screen and civic life thank and you children's Picture books <laughs> and children's pictures book. That exactly to right. be children's coming to your neighborhood bookstores. Ex exactly right, and we look forward to you uh, uh, putting that out there for us. And folks, please check it out. It is they called us enemy, uh, and uh, you can get it. It is a wonderful um, uh, story about um, through the eyes of a child uh, what it was like. Uh, to live a life inside of an internment camp and still 
and still find the American spirit. So I appreciate you, brother. I really, really do. So that does it for this time of our conversation, folks. You know I love it when you do the download thing. It makes me feel all yummy inside. I love to feel yummy inside. I appreciate it. But you know what else you got to do for me? Get the damn vaccine. Wear the mask. Can we get past the COVID thing and move on to something else? All right. And that requires you doing your part. So until next time, do that. Be well and be safe.